All right. We're doing too much, Sayla. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Okay, we're getting ready to have our lunch and learn and financing contracts featuring Ms. Stacy Mollison. I'm always excited when we are able to get a, a piece of her time um, and making sure that you all continue to gain the knowledge through this lessons learned. Uh, you all are giving me just one more second as I continue to coordinate on my Facebook page because this is being streamed. Okay. Welcome, Miss Stacy. Good morning. As I said, we're always excited um, when we have you. And okay, I'm just trying to decrease this a little bit. So that I can get things going. I do have um, I do have Shayla online and Dina. I need some contracts featuring I do have Shayla. Hi everybody. Okay. I need some contracts. All right. Okay. Here we go. All right, now I am fully engaged with Facebook. Uh, we're fully engaged with the community. And I think we're ready to go. It's 12.01. How's everybody? Happy New Year's. You can put that in the chat. I'm glad to have everyone join us. Um, Stacy, for some reason, we can't see your face. I know. I <laughs> Use video. Huh? I have. Let me see. Let me go out and let let me go out and come back in. I'm not sure why it's not on video. Okay. And so while you're doing that, I'm just going to go over um some housekeeping for everyone, so you all can see what we have coming up. We're looking forward to an exciting new year. Um, praying and knowing that good things are going to happen to all of you all who come through the program. And now it's, it's important that we continue to um, educate and become engaged. I decided this year, my two words were intentional and strategic. We all have to be intentional and strategic while Stacy is um, going back in and out so that we can make sure that her camera is working. Just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, as always, we're all about the community. We're all about understanding the power of collect uh, a collaboration. Um, we're better as one as opposed to being an individual. So please put your name in the chat box, your location, email information, areas of expertise, background, because you never know, this could be potential partnerships and resource partners. So when I look at the number of people that's online, I'm always saying, this is a contract. <laughs> um, you can get a piece of the pie. You can get a piece of the pie. She can get a piece of the pie. It's all about collaboration and us pulling all of our skill sets together so that we really can take over in 2024. Amen, everybody. I'm always I'm excited to announce um, two of our CEOs have won their first contracts this year while in class. I'd like to congratulate Danielle Bowie, CEO of Prosper Solutions. She just won her first contract this week, or day before yesterday. She's currently in the October cohort. Michael Tucker, CEO of Tucker Coaching and Consulting, also won his first contract. Um, that was two weeks ago. So. 
congratulations to the CEOs. You all are putting in the work in and it is um, showing up. Tomorrow um, is the information session for as we kick off the January cohort. For those of you that have participated in the program and benefited from the program, please share. Uh, we've had a strong referral base and it's important that we continue um, building out our community. The next cohort will start on Tuesday. I'm excited with this instructor. It's George Thurman. She has over 40 years of experience working inside of the SBA. Um, she's also a contracting officer. What makes me excited about her is because I will consistently say, unless you've worked on the inside of SBA, no one understands their rules and regulations. And she was way above my pay grade. So we only have 10 seats remaining. Please um, uh, uh, forward the information if you know someone in your community that's ready to change their legacy. Uh, we've also introduced the self-paced classes. Um, learn at your own pace. You also have access to our office hours, templates, and lab sessions. For those of you who have completed the program, this is the next level of school where now you're able to go through bidding on steroids with attorney Chandler, where she's actually walking you through submitting 10 bids in a month. Now is the time. Now is the start time to start creating your strategy before the end of the fiscal year, creating these templates, understanding how you can leverage what you've learned in my program in this class. You have to be, you have to have completed our program in order to go through the graduate class. We're also hosting uh, and, and partnering with Tanisha Gamry. You all heard her on the last uh, le last Lunch and Learn. This conference is going to be held May 2nd uh, at the Riverside uh, Epic Center. It's going to be designed around a small business industry day. And I also am giving out a shout out to my NARAB community because I love the NARAB family. They are having their mid-winter conference in Charlotte, and that's February 28th through the 20, uh, through the second, I believe those are the dates. Stacy, you can correct me. And the regional conference that will be here May 2nd through the 4th. It's all about networking, collaborate, collaboration, and building out resources. With that being said, uh, as I stated earlier, I'm so excited when Stacy um, comes back and share her. I'm here. Lessons yeah. learned and how she can impact our community and and key things. This is real time, so take out your um, pens and pens, uh, paper and begin to take some notes. So Stacy. How you doing? You can unmute. We're here. I can see your face. Um, Happy, hey, Miss Paula. Happy New Year. I haven't seen you since 2023, since Jamaica. <laughs> How are you? I am wonderful. So thank you again. But we do have some new um, participants that have joined us today. And, and I always like to start out with people's journey so that they can understand the pathway that you've taken to get where you are. Everyone always see the end goal, but they don't know all the steps that um, you've had to take to begin build this successful business that you've had. So you're originally from Guyana. Let's start, talk, start with the childhood to <laughs> up here. Oh, oh, <laughs> the whole snapshots, but as a child, did you see yourself being an entrepreneur? 
100% absolutely. Um, there is a saying in my country, I'm from Guyana, South America, that my grandmother said I was too hard ears. That means that I don't listen. And so I had to have my own business. So, <laughs> so she planted that seed a very long time ago that you're going to have to work for yourself because you like to do things your way. <laughs> <laughs> and that was me as well. <laughs> it only lasted three, uh, three years was my max with most uh, companies. So um, you all grew up, you grew up in New York and uh -huh. let's start from your journey to New York to Atlanta and now Charlotte and Atlanta. You okay. Have, all right. Yeah. So I came to the States when I was 10 years old. Um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And, and when you talk about how early I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I'm really serious, y'all. I went to a high school called Murray. If people from New York, I'm going to shout out Murray Bertram High School for Business Careers. Yeah, shout out Bertram. So I traveled. I lived in Brooklyn, New York, and I traveled two and a half hours on the train um, from 14 years. They're 13, 14 years old to Bertram to go to high school. And so um, I was in a, a, a gifted program called Arista when I was in junior high. And if you were in Arista for the folks from New York, um, you got an opportunity to um, test into, I guess Arista is kind of like AP or something, but it was an actual program in our junior high school where they had like all well, the, the gifted students in like one program. And um, you got an opportunity to test into a high school of your choice and you didn't have to go to your community high school. So I tested, I knew I wanted to do business and I tested into Bertram. So Bertram was actually in Manhattan in New York City. So I traveled from Brooklyn, two buses, two trains um, every single day um, in high school to go to Bertram. And they also had a program called co-op. So when you went to Bertram, you had different tracks. My track was uh, marketing and finance. And so you only went to school one week and then you went to work the other. And I'm talking full fledged in a business suit in a corporate environment at 14 years old. So my first job in corporate was at Apple Savings Bank as a student banker and a, um, a marketing um, uh, intern. And so um, Let me I did ask you a question. Were those, <laughs> ro how, did you have role models that was helping you through this? When was that? Uh, did you acquire role models? It's I acquired role models along the way. So um, for me, I just knew I wanted to be in a business environment. Um, wanted to do business. Wasn't really sure initially. I thought I wanted to do business law, and so. Um, yeah, so I, I I worked at Apple Savings Bank all the way through sophomore year in college, and they paid for me to go to um, college. And yeah, so they paid for me to go to college. I worked through sophomore year of college. And then um, I came to Atlanta because, like I said, I thought it, I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. So I came to Atlanta to take the LSAT and go to law school. And... Um, I, I got here and then realized that lawyers didn't really make that much money and I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> so, that's how that happened. <laughs> so, so where did your career path go once you determined you were going to be a lawyer? Uh, you know, because it started really by, um, I started working, my first job was at DeKalb County Sheriff. Um, department as an officer. And that's kind of where I recognized that, wow, I didn't, I, I met Judge Green. For anybody in DeKalb County that knew Judge Green, um, Judge Green was a role model for me because Judge Green was somebody that told me I was really smart. And he thought that, you know, I could do other things. And, you know, I, I think he, um, demystified the, the the lawyer part for me and helped me as, as a judge, helped me to recognize that there was an opportunity for me to maybe look at at other ways that um, I could do something. And so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of how, and I couldn't figure it out for a while. 
And um, I started doing real estate because I wanted to go back and get my master's. And so I wanted a job. I worked a lot of overtime. So that was back. I was 22 years old. I was making $65,000 a year working at the sheriff department because I worked a lot of overtime. And what and were you doing at the sheriff department? I was an officer. I was an officer at the sheriff department. <laughs> and um, a badge I, and a gun and all of yeah, that. Yeah, a whole bang. <laughs> and so... I um, thought that, um, you know, I really wanted to do something. I felt like I had made this commitment to myself that um, I would not turn 30 years old and not be in grad school because that was a goal of mine to have my master's degree. So I said to myself, OK, um, in September, uh, I was turning 30 in October. In September, I, I uh, went to grad school. So I really, I started doing real estate because I wanted a something that was flexible, that I could still make the same kind of money, but I could go to school full time. And that's kind of how I, and I, I, the person that sold me, because I bought a house very young. Um, I bought a house at, I think, 23 years old. I, my first house I bought at 23 and so my broker that sold me my house, man, she was living fantastic. She was, you know, she had a beautiful home. Um, she had a really nice car. And, you know, she would take me all the best restaurants to eat. And I would say to her, like, what are you doing? And she explained to me that if I worked really hard in real estate, I really could make a lot of money. So I, um, I uh, got my real estate license and I started working with her part time. I, what age? Um, I guess I was uh, 28, somewhere, no, uh, yeah, somewhere, yeah, 28, 29, somewhere in there. And um, yep, right before I started school. And we, um, and that's how I kind of, I got into real estate and recognized that, wow, this was a really good thing. So I left the sheriff department and started working for Remax of Atlanta, all my Atlanta folks. I was at Remax. That was a big office. They had multiple office. They had over 120 agents and they were banging it. I mean, it was a high production office. And I went on a team that was a high producing team. And so um, shout out to Diane uh, Clayton Anderson and um, Greg Turner. They taught me the game of real estate and even more, they taught me um, REO. That office, I think, Remax of Atlanta, those agents there, um, really Nia, Nia Marie, all of those people embraced me, Lucretia Ramsey, Charles Canty, those people really embraced me and taught me a lot about business, about being an entrepreneur, about, uh, you know, killing what you, what you eat. You know, you got to survive and you got to get out there and hustle. And so I think that's where I really started to develop my entrepreneurial skills. Mm, so you understood real estate was business, but on a different level Absolutely. because you're in essence self-employed, not necessarily managing a business. So mm -hmm. you were an agent for how long before you transferred to becoming a broker? Exactly how long it took you to transfer. Three years is the time you got to be an agent before you can be a broker. As soon as three years was up, I was in there getting my broker's license. <laughs> so I immediately transitioned. And then um, I got the opportunity. Remax of Atlanta um, was a high performing um, office. So it was, it was um, you had to pay a lot of rent and stuff. I only worked with Diane and Greg for about a year and a half. And then I transitioned to um, being an independent agent there at Remax. And um, I went into commercial real estate for a little while. That's where I met um, Karen Johnson. I met Karen Johnson because uh, she ran an office and I worked for her uh, for a short time um, in a commercial division. And uh, Mm -hmm. okay. I started my own company once the market crashed. 
Yep, and we transitioned to really um, distressed um, property sales on REO. I started my own company back in 2000. I started in 2006 because I thought that I wanted to just start a commercial firm and then the market crashed. And then I saw an opportunity to get into distressed asset sales, asset management. And I took the opportunity and focused my business primarily on um, REO and asset management. And that was in 2006 and that's when the market really started going down. So from 2007, really to about 2000 uh, to 2013, uh, my business was solely focused on um, REO and that business was great. Um, I really I really got an opportunity to really um, grow as a leader, grow as an entrepreneur, expand my business, have employees and have a large volume of, of business coming in the door. We had three offices um, during that time, had an office um, on the south side, office in Gwinnett and an office in Conyers. And so how old are you at this time, my dear? <laughs> I'm in my in my thirties. I'm in my early thirties here. I'm in my thirties, and so it. Listen, it was a blessing. I feel like um, I have really experienced the gamut of being able to be in multiple industries and thrive, and um, it has made me a better leader for it. Okay, and and what I've always loved about you guys, you all have the sim similar stories, different pathway in regard, but still the same. It's all about learning and relationships. So you you became involved in NARAB and then you became the president of the Empire um, chapter. Hello, Empire. Um, and you were able to um, build relationships. That's And that's what I'll consistently say about NARAB. You all have the that networking. It's just so powerful in the relationships you build. So along the line, you're running your business and then you become the Empire Board of President, the Empire Board President. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that was your switch to come into government contracts with, in that relationship sort of? Uh, um, so I was doing REO and we had, um, so I was on this journey to get as many um, Black brokers into um, uh, um, asset management. At the time, that was the thriving business. I had seen my um, my counterparts really make a lot of money, and I saw that people of color weren't getting the opportunities to be the listing agents, only the selling agents. So um, my affiliation with NARAB allowed um, me to have the opportunity um, President Hicks back in 2009, I had really come to him complaining about how they needed to do things differently at the board. And, he, and I was really having like a real grudge fest with him. And he turned to me and he said, so get into leadership and change it. <laughs> and the, so, um, so he got in. Yep. So he. Um, encouraged me to do something about the concerns. So um, he had appointed me a, a, a REO task force. And that task force really was about how do we um, leverage the power of NARAB across the country and make a real concerted effort to get access to minority business owners in the real estate game to um, be able to be listing agents on those opportunities. So I actually, we formed a national REO task force. I was the chair of the local and the national, and we really did some good work. We got a lot of folks in NARAB into um, REO networks, and we were really able to help a lot of agents really make some money and do some business. I'm really proud of that work. Um, NARAB was involved in the drafting of the Dodd-Frank Act, our president sat uh, in front of Congress and talked about 
um, the challenges that we had as people of color um, dealing with discriminatory practices in the um, financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was a lot of policy and legislation that came out of the efforts that we put forward as a, as a group in NARAP um, to, to do that work. So I'm really proud of the things we were able to do back then. And with that, we really established a really strong relationship with HUD, um, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And at that time, um, Ed Jennings um, had been appointed. He had been a um, legislator in his home state of uh, Gainesville, Florida, and he was appointed by the Obama administration as the Southeast Regional Administrator for HUD. And we have been doing a lot of uh, community advocacy work, and he recognized that they had brought me up to Washington, D.C., um, to a HUD event. And he took me out to dinner, and he just basically sat me down and said, hey, you're like working so hard. At that time, I had um, received um, uh, the contract for both Ofori and um, Home Telos as a HUD neighborhood listing broker. We were running hundreds of REO property. And um, he said, I see you working so hard. I see you out here doing all this advocacy work, but you're hustling, you're running empire, you're doing all this stuff you need to be a prime. He said, when we get back to Atlanta, I want you to go down to the SBA office and I want you to learn about the 8A certification. And um, I want you to um, become a prime because they were getting ready to rebid the um, REO asset management contract, which was a $400 million um, uh, real estate services contract um, that I was a sub on. So um, that's where the opportunity really started. And, and um, once I came back, the, I'm, a, I'm a person that follow instructions. When people tell me about something that can help me succeed and thrive, I'm going to follow through on it. I'm going to investigate it and I'm going to see if that fits in into something that can help me achieve my goal in a more strategic manner. And so um, I literally came back to Atlanta, went down to uh, 233 Peachtree, uh, the SBA district office. And there's where I met Ms. Paula Watts. I, I really went to several classes. Let me say this. I went to several classes now because um, what used to happen back then uh, prior to COVID is that SBA, uh, the district office used to host all these training uh, classes. And as a business owner interested in participating in government contracting, you had an opportunity to go down to the office and sit in the classes and learn. And so I had sat in several classes and then you did your class. And I was just, I think for me, I always tell people that this, you know, people have been saying a lot to me, but this light bulb moment happened um, when you said in that particular class that I was in. Um, and what I have been doing is sharing everything that I was learning with my members at Empire. So we were like, we were trying to encourage, let's all pool resources, get together and bid um, on the asset management contract. So um, we had been sharing, so we had all started coming down to the SBA office. And I remember you saying distinctly, I'm so sick of all these real estate agents coming in here and all y'all care about is this mm -hmm. HUD contract. Y'all are so short-sighted. It's like y'all bottom feeders, y'all like all fighting for like the same thing. And I was like, duh, you know, <laughs> no, like she's getting on us. But then you said, this is what I want to say to y'all. I used to be a government contractor and I was my main book of business was event planning, and I had the real the contract to uh, provide the lead-based paint addendum to all the real estate attorneys. And that was a, a $3 million contract. And then you said, stupid money. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on? And I think that's for me when it became more than the HUD contract. Mm -hmm. Because I, in, in, initially I was just focused on, I'm going to come in here, I'm going to learn and I'm going to, you know, uh, put in for the HUD contract, I'm going to win it and this is what it's going to be. And so 
Um, when you said that, and you know, Paula, I just kept calling and harassing you like, ma'am, can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? And so for me, I really wanted you to come and talk to our group at Empire because I felt that that message had hit me so hard that we all needed to hear it to expand our mindset. And so um, that's where it all began. You were um, um, instrumental in helping me to draft and review my um, my 8A package. I'm so grateful for that. Um, I begged you, I'm like, Ms. Paula, can you please review my 8A package? And you taught me that I didn't even structure my 8A um, my package properly. And you even showed me how to put my 8A package together. And I was able to successfully, and people have been struggling um, within a nine month period, successfully um, get approved for my 8A. And I think more importantly, you taught me as we um, got to know each other and you started to work with me and mentor me, um, I always tell people what I learned from you was that my thinking was too small, mm -hmm. that I did not give myself the opportunity to think of government contracting from a very holistic perspective, and that real estate was just a segment of the services that I could actually provide to the government. And you encouraged me to not use the real estate NAICS code um, as my primary NAICS code. And we switched it to 541611, which is management and consulting, because essentially what you explained to me, you said, tell me what you do in asset management. And I told you that we had a 166 tasks that we were required from A to Z, the whole life cycle of an asset from the time we get that asset to all the tasks we had to do to actually sell that asset um, for the government. It was really about 166 tasks that were involved in there. And so when I explained that to you, you said you do management. Y'all doing management. Y'all taking on the responsibility of taking on, uh, putting on lights, y'all doing lawn care, y'all doing trash out. And at that time, I even had a trash out business. I had my real estate REO business and I had another business doing trash out. So I had two businesses and we had 12 employees. And so at that time, you really broke it down for me that um, I really needed to create a whole new business model, segment my services, real estate as one of my uh, my service income streams, and then build it out a little differently. So thank you again so much for, <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to expand my mind. And that's why I tell them often, they're, they're getting the, the Bentley because I didn't have this program while I was in SBA at SBA and I couldn't disclose, you know, too much, but I just remember you coming to my office and you're saying to me, Paula, if you just mentor me, um, I promise you I will make you proud. And I remember giving you a thumb drive at that time, right? With all those templates. I said, you're gonna need this. <laughs> and you've taken it and I am. I'm proud of, of where you've you've come. And, and it's all about what I love about you. You always want to give back. You're trying to bring those along, but she's not gonna fool with you, but so much. <laughs> you don't follow instructions and she don't have time for you. But at the same time, you're getting your family involved. So that again, this is how we truly begin to create generational wealth. Um uh, um, I, we're going to continue on with Amazon and all of that, but this Lunch and Learn was primarily focused on the financing of contracts um, because that's the biggest challenge for us when we start competing and winning contracts. Um, a lot of us, again, start our business. We self-finance, so our credit's not as well as others. Um, even bankruptcy. You know, I've had to go through a bankruptcy. We've had to 
hide behind even having bankruptcy because you feel like you're a black mark, but there's always ways to get around it. So you're going through that real estate ups and down, um, income coming in, not coming in. Uh, how did you begin to strategically understand what steps you needed to take to begin financing your business, regardless whether it's real estate or government? Um, I think I learned the hard way. Um, I, I want to caution the folks on the call now that it starts today. I think I was of the man mindset that I needed to wait to get a contract to worry about financing. And so I wish that I knew the information that I know now that financing is before you even ever get a contract. Right. And so we need to prepare ourselves if we're not um, uh, in a business that has a lot of um, historical data um, around financing. Uh, we don't have business credit um, or well, our business. If you've been right, bankrupt. or bankruptcy, any of that, that you, this is the time when you start to work on your personal credit. And so it, you you can achieve success in uh, business credit by um, working on your personal credit and making yourself a guarantor. And so I'll say this, I myself um, had a bankruptcy. I went through a divorce, um, uh, decided to walk away with nothing and start over. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of property. And um, at that time, my ex-husband was not interested in continuing to um, hold those properties that were upside down um, in the marketplace. So um, I went through a bankruptcy just so we could separate those assets um, and I not have liability for them. And so um, rebuilding credit was something that um, I really worked hard to do. And so um, I was able, I tell people this, to utilize Capital One is a really great credit card. You can get a secured. I got a secured personal credit card with Capital One and I funded it with $5,000 and started to build. So I would use that card to do basic necessities. So I would do all my groceries, my gas, all the things that I did every day. Um, I would utilize that card that was already secured um, and, and, and start to get activity on that card. And it helped to really build my credit really quickly. And then I worked on really just getting uh, cleaning up my credit. And then I applied for a Capital One Business Spark card, a Capital One Spark business card. Now, the only thing with the Spark card, it really helps you to build business credit really quickly. However, it is tied to your personal credit. So you have to be careful with that. And it could damage your personal credit if you aren't managing the payments and the um, the balance on the, the balance ratio on that card. But I do recommend the if you're, your uh, credit challenge on both the personal side and the uh, business side that you use the secure Capital One secure card to work on the personal, and then you leverage the um, the the Spark card to build business credit. So and you still can't, well, how, let's let's back up because again, I think uh, you're not the first. I'm not the first. So how are you still generating revenue and you bankrupt? So let's get make sure folks understand yeah. how. So here, those, are, those are two different things. We we really, um, I, I, that was personal bankruptcy. That wasn't a, a, a business bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. My business was still growing and thriving and doing. And it was because we had uh, uh, real estate that was upside down. Right. And it ju we just could not um, continue right. to pay for those to, those properties. And then we had property in other state, you know, that kind of thing. So that was a decision to save. And then I was going through a divorce and the, the ex-husband did not want to keep the properties. So there was really, really, I was forced into bankruptcy. My lawyer told me, this is the only way that you're going to be able to save yourself. Okay. And so 
that was advice from my lawyer that this was something we needed to do to make sure that I came out and still was able to salvage my personal credit and um, to salvage my uh, my business as well. Okay. So that's kind of but they still tie in together, don't you? Yeah. When you're trying to get the business credit, so you take money from your business to get those capital ones to start oh, building. Yeah. So I think once you business. start, so once you start building the credit with the with the capital one, mm -hmm. then you have an opportunity. I then applied because now my my credit is building up. And it's looking good. I'm being very, um, you know, methodical about that. And uh, now I apply for an American Express uh, Platinum card. And so the American Express, I, I believe really and truly, this is like the best card for business. Like business owners who have an American Express Platinum card, I know you you hear me that it's a wonderful card. I, I think it's it's been a tremendous card to me. I started off with um, um, the American Express Platinum card um, at I think $5,000 was what they would give me. I think now we're like at $200,000 or something with it, right? But we started out with that card with like $5,000 and really um, working to grow. And one thing with the American Express Platinum card is that if you're a good payer, they immediately increase you, they increase you, they increase you. And so I have now three different cards with American Express that all have high, um, high balances. And then now I have like, now, now I'm very, um, uh, uh, I know the information that's necessary to make sure I'm making good choices about which credit card. So let me say this. When you're looking for credit business credit cards, please, please, please be very certain that you're getting a business credit card that is not tied to your personal credit. The only time you should get a business credit card that's not tied to your personal credit is if you have issues with your personal credit and that's the only one you can get. But an American Express Platinum uh, business card, this is not tied to your personal credit. So it doesn't matter what happens in your business. It, even though you're a guarantor for the card, it doesn't affect your credit score and your, your personal credit score and your personal uh, uh, financial data. So it's really important, like Bank of America, Bank of America, uh, I have a Bank of America business credit card that is not tied to, um, it's not tied to your personal credit. So now mm -hmm. I invest in making sure that I deal with um, credit cards that are not tied to my personal um, credit and would not damage my personal credit in the event that something catastrophic happens within my business. So in my first business, I had an American Express. And again, most of people in our community, we self-finance our business. That's the reality. But and that then again that affects your personal business. But with the American Express, I was having to, they gave me up to a hundred thousand dollars in line of credit. But the challenge I had in with American Express was I was having to pay it off every month. So yeah. it was messing yeah, with the cash flow. Now. Yeah, it's different. It depends on how what kind of payee you are that you you can you can get grace and, and even the American Express Plum, it gives you an additional 30 days as long as you just pay 10% of the the um the balance. And so uh, American Express has really um shifted a lot. And I think that people have this preconceived notion about how the card works. I mean, the times have changed a lot and, and I have not struggled with this card in any way. Like I said, I started off with 5,000 and now we have hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. in, in credit from this same vendor. And I've been extremely pleased by um, my engagement with them. Um, yep. Okay, so then, all uh, right. So when do you get involved with banks and factoring companies? And that's what Ooh. we were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this conversation, y'all. I, uh, again, so all of this is happening on the back end <laughs> because my credit was jacked up and then I was here trying to repair credit 
trying to work through. I didn't have business credit. This is the other thing. If you don't have a Dun & Bradstreet number today, every single person that gets off this phone, if you have a business, you're interested in doing business with the federal government, or if you're just doing business in general, you need to have a Dun & Bradstreet number, a DMV number. Do not pay for it. You get that number free, but the Dun & Bradstreet number is what triggers business credit. So the paid at score is what comes from having that DMV number. So that's your uh, your business credit score. It's paid X, P A Y D E X. Uh, your paid X credit score is your business credit score. And other uh, companies, Experian and stuff, they uh, report to it as well. But your DMV has to be initiated for it to be triggered. And so um, a, a good paid at score is a score above 80. I want y'all to hear me say that. 75, 80. Um, it's, uh, above 80 is an A rating. So um, you want to shoot for having a, a above 80 paid at score. And so you need to have a DMB number to achieve that. So now I'm, I'm learning all this stuff, right? And I, I win this contract. And I win this $3.3 million contract at CDC. And I now have to fund, I think we had. Um, but, but let's, let's go back. Before you got that $3 million contract, you had won some of the RFQs, those small, smaller buys. How did you finance those smaller buys? credit cards and uh, taking out um, advances on, on credit cards, taking my uh, personal money and doing that. It, uh, that was what how I financed the, the first couple of smaller contracts where um, my first very first contract with the federal government was a contract doing um, uh, washing and restoring 2,500 windows for two courthouses in Jackson, Mississippi. That contract was $197,000. It, it started off with like $150,000, and then we had some additional work, and it ended up, I think, close to $200,000, um, that contract. And so with that, um, we had to pay the subcontractor, and the good news was we negotiated with the subcontractor um, that he was going to get delayed payment with the government. We were going to pay him a certain amount when the when the job was done. And then he would uh, understand that we're a small business. He wanted to get the work to show a past performance there and that um, we would pay him. So the, the government, we worked with the government to um, try to get that to pay him. Um, and he was, uh, I will say that that first contract, my um, subcontractor was very forgiving. Uh, and he really um, gave me some leeway to wait to get payment from the federal government. Um, how, but long, then, how long did it take for them, the government, to pay once the job was closed? That one took long. It took about 60 days. It took a long time. And uh, he, what I did with him was we paid him a smaller amount um, after the 30 days. And then it took actually closer to 90 days because we were outside of 60 days. And uh, what I was doing with him, I was very transparent. And so I had been upfront about him that it was my first contract. And I, I thanked him for working with me and giving me the opportunity. And then I had show I was keeping and here's the thing people communicate I was communicating with him consistently and showing him all my emails that I was going back and forth with the vendor so there was no confusion that I was trying to stiff him I wasn't trying to pay him you know he knew what we were dealing with and then there were some things that we were kind of going back and forth about why they hadn't paid because there was a particular thing that wasn't cleared by the vendor you know they were nitpicking at these things so he was very forgiving in that instance but then when i won the the bigger contract i really didn't have 
the financial wherewithal. I thought it would be simple for me to take that contract, show a, a bank I had improved my credit. Here's where I was. I've gotten, I now got this $3 million contract and please give me a loan, of course. Why not? You know, and so they were like, no, we don't understand that business. And I want y'all to hear me say that most local, most, most of the financial institutions, they really are skeptical about financing government contractors. And so you really have to go to uh, banking institutions that are familiar with how the, the the and I think it's a lot of misinformation that's out there about government contracts. And I heard somebody say this yesterday that a lot of times it's if they don't understand that these contracts are long term and they really thinking it's more like uh, project based. And these are not sustainable contracts. My contract was a five-year contract. So it was sustainable. It was something that I could borrow against, but the bank was not interested. And this is how I got to factoring. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. Factoring companies understand it. They, right. they get it. They get it, but they also kill you with the fees. And that's why I tell people, Sometimes um, you have to do what you have to do, but I gave $90,000 of my profit away to factoring companies because I didn't know I could negotiate. I didn't know, I just know I needed the money and I needed to meet payroll. So based on your experience, what have you learned that you like to share to others? Okay, so the first thing first, I, I always like to start by explaining things, right? So what is factoring? You know, because there might be people who are not sure what exactly they hear the term, they hear, you know, federal contractors talking about it. What exactly is factoring? So factoring is when you literally sell your receivables uh, and they advance you payment on your receivables. And then they're the ones that own that receivable and then they um, charge you a fee for advancing you that money and then they collect on the receivable. So it's really a third party company coming in, buying your um, your accounts receivable from you, your invoice um, that you're, you're getting, and then they pay you the money, a portion typically, it's like anywhere from 75 to 90% of it. And then they charge you a fee. Uh, but here's where it gets really different with federal contracting, right? And I, I, I wanna, um, I wanna read. Um, I, I pulled a couple of definitions of factoring because I want people to to clearly understand. So I'm gonna read. Say check cashing stores. <laughs> if you understand check cashing yeah. stores, uh, so um, factoring. It's when um, a finance. It's a financial practice where a company sells its invoices to a third party financial institution at a discount for immediate cash. The factor collects payment from the customers and the company receives funding without waiting for payment or taking on additional debt. But here's the tricky part that people don't understand. The factor now owns the invoice, mm -hmm. right? The factor now files a UCC filing on you. So let me explain what a UCC filing, a UCC file, UCC filings are an essential component of the factoring process. It protects the interests of both the factors and the business. The, uh, for the factors, these filings ensure that their claim over the accounts receivable is legally secured and protected from any competing claims. So when you use a factoring company when you sell that invoice under the federal regulations. So let me explain something. When you become a federal contractor and you register in SAM.gov, there's a section that asks for your financial information. In that section on SAM.gov, so let me explain how the government works. The government only the reason why you must register in sam.gov to do business with the government is because the government only pays you to the the information that you have inputted in sam.gov 
So you go and you put all your banking information because the your government asks you, how should we pay you? And you say in Sam.gov, pay me at this account, blah, blah, blah. When you turn your invoice over to a factoring company, you got to go change the banking information to theirs. Mm -hmm. The money don't come to you. The money now goes because remember, you've sold this invoice. You no longer are the first uh, person on this invoice. The factoring company now it makes you change the banking information in SAM.gov to their bank account. And sometimes they put what's called a lockbox on it, right? Now, when the government pays the, that money, because they remember now, they've already advanced you payment. So that money comes to them and anything remaining, because they do sometimes a 10% hold back, they then will send that money to you, right? So they may advance you, whatever the hold back is. If they advance you 70% and they charge you three to 5% for advancing you that money, they take their fees out and then they send you whatever is remaining of what they didn't advance you. Now, here's the important thing. You now have to tell the government that you doing this because that's not what the government signed with you when you won the contract. So you are really required, and a lot of people are not doing this. You're really required to get a modification of your contract, letting them know that there's been a new assignee uh, on the financial portion of the contract. And the factor is now the entities whose information is placed on SAM.gov. The other part why that's important is because if the government doesn't pay on time, the factor is now the collection agency. And the factor is now the person that's reaching out to the government, no longer you. And here's where everything went south with me. I had an awful factor. The fees were high. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they had that UCC filing. They changed it. But they began to harass my contracting officers. They then started calling the, fact, the, the contracting officer, sending these crazy emails. Pay us now. Do this. Do that. I mean, it was in. Saying, I'm telling y'all, I was in tears. It was a nightmare. And I'm calling them, letting them know, look, this is not the approach. You cannot speak to the contracting officers like that. Like, I'm on this contract. You can't be harassing these people. I did follow the right steps. My contracting officer did modify the contract. So thank God I, I had been transparent about that process. And and now all these different fees, I didn't do a good job of really reading through the, the, the fine print of all the additional fees and how those fees were going to be accrued based on the government not paying. If the government didn't pay in, in 15 days, there was this fee added. If they ain't paying 30 days, another fee added. And I was racking up fees. It was the most stressful time of my life. And so I the, 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 the good thing that happened with me is I had a fantastic contracting officer who was very experienced with this. And literally, I was calling her like, in, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. This like, I don't know what to do. I don't, and, and she said, let me talk to you offline. And she called me. She said, listen here, young lady. I see how hard you're working on this contract. You're doing a great job. Don't let these people bully you. She said, do you know that you can go get somebody else? She said, go find a better factoring. She said, I ain't got no problem with factoring, but I, I have a problem with them harassing me. And she said, I'm going to shut them down right now. And mm -hmm. she sent them a nasty email basically saying, do not contact me. Your your my contract is not with you. It's with Stacy Mollison. Do not contact me unless um, she is the person that's initiating the contact. And she's like, I'm going to report you guys. 
And so she pushed them back off of me and gave me the opportunity to go find another. And that's how I got to now account. But how do you, uh, cause I think my challenge was, it was um, always a revolving cycle because you're now have, have borrowed off of them. Now you've cut them out the government. <laughs> Um, and there, that, that was a challenge because you're, did they want you to sign all your contracts or was it just, yes, a this, it, oh, yes. so this is important. When you sign up with a factoring company, you're essentially telling them that every federal contract, cause remember y'all, they're the people that are now in the financial section on sam.gov so essentially every contract that you win goes through them so you got multiple contracts now that's going into this the financial company to this factoring company's bank account and uh -huh. so that's how they get you because it's not just one contract is they say to you we're wow. going to fund you but we need to get all your contracts until this relationship is over. And it's very difficult to get. I had a lot of pushback in trying to get out. But what was good for me is that I'm a, a creature of documentation. And I had so much documentation of how they had mistreated the contracting staff, how they had really um, had some really uh, poor practices in, in debt collection and uh, how they had not disclosed to me properly about the fee structure. And mm -hmm. so I made sure that I started to ask questions and document, and I used that to really um, compile a complaint against them. And, um, and so when we started working with Now Corp, which is um, Now Corp acts like a factoring company and um, but they're different. And the reason why I, I recommend now Corp, which is uh, N-O-W-C-O-R-P.com and uh, anybody that's interested in, in utilizing um, now account, it's either now account, now, now Corp, let me know. They've been a tremendous support system for me. And so when I found out, I actually- well, how, how do they let you know? You want their email um, in there? Yeah. Yes, if they can provide, um, if they, yeah, I put, if you put my email address in there, they can reach out to me and I can give you a contact at okay. now Corp that um, will, will help. So what I tell people is, um, what, what I tell people is, um, you know, what you need to do is, um, make sure that you understand. So the difference with now Corp is, People call them a factoring company. They call themselves more of a funding cooperative. And the difference with, with now Corp is it's the same process. You assign your all your receivables to them. They take out the UCC filing, but they're not a factor company in the in the sense that their fees are um are interest. Their fees are considered bank like bank charges not interest fees so they act more like a merchant account where it's like more bank fees so here's what's significant with that when you're doing business with the government there's what's called allowable expenses and unallowable expenses interest fees on debt is not considered allowable they're unallowable expenses. So you cannot deduct interest fees from uh, in, in doing government contracting in business on your tax return. However, you can deduct bank fees. You can deduct uh, credit card fees, right? So the difference with now account is that now they fall under this uh, more of like a bank card. And so you can now deduct those fees that they charge you for using the service as uh, uh as 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 charge fees right credit card or or, or uh, fees so that's the difference and now account they are not uh, they have really great practices if there's an issue with payment 
they involve you and they talk to you. They let you know, hey, we haven't received payment. We're going to reach out to this vendor, to the government. Here is what we're going to do. And you're CC'd on every single email that they send. When we send our invoices to the government, um, they're CC'd and then vice versa if there's an issue. So you're always engaged and involved in a process and they're not doing that. So I want to make sure that people understand factoring is not a bad thing. However, I think what happens is that we're not clear about the dynamics of it, particularly from the federal uh, government standpoint. The other part that I struggled with is that you have to get that factoring company to release the UCC filing because you can't engage with another financial institution because whoever filed got that top filing, they're the first, uh, the first person in line over that debt. So one of the challenges that I had, I had to get a lawyer to threaten the, the factoring company was they didn't want to release the UCC file and so I could go on with now. So those are really critical and important things that I want people to understand when you're engaging with a factor. And what types of, if you just a starter, is there a certain a client base that they tend to target? Again, if I'm just starting up, Oh, I won my first contract, can and it's a small contract. Can I go to them to ask them to finance that contract? Uh, no, I think uh, um, you know factoring is, is very much like a lot of the banks. You know, they still have a a, a, a criteria for um, if they onboard you or not. Now, they their criteria is not as stringent as a bank in terms of getting on board, but you still have to be approved by the factor. And mm -hmm. so I want, you know, people think, oh, I just go to a factor, they just take me. No, you still have to go because remember, this is credit risk. So mm -hmm. they just want, they also want to make sure you're not a high risk. So all those things come into play personal credit, uh, business credit, you're a guarantor, all these things still come into play. Um, so it, it's the same, it's still a, a, a financial institution. And when I was tied, well, that's when I had the 7A loan. That was an SBA loan. I had to collateralize it with my house. And when I closed the business, which, which again, I, I didn't have the knowledge of the UCC filings and what all that meant, but the factory company got their money off the top. So mm -hmm. SBA was the second in line to, to get that. But we're we're getting close. This is pretty good, everyone. What you all think? She's dropped some time here. Um, we do have a couple of questions here, and then we're, you can give us five more minutes. You're all right with that? I know. I'm, I'm here. Any questions? Uh, um, do you associate the factors information with the bid? And what if you have more than one bid going on? This is Miss King's question from a. The, the, the factor can actually give you a letter. So you got, and, and I leverage the letter um, to get other contracts. So remember the factor is now your financial institution and they're now providing um, uh, financing for you. So they can actually provide a letter saying that they're going to be the financial arm that can fund uh, mobilization, because typically with with contract, um, it's it's the mobilization funding to ramp up and stuff that we struggle with while we end up in a situation where we need to factor, right? Because anytime you win a ser a service or product contract, there is the mobilization funding that's required to stand up that contract, and so you have to know at least you should have some kind of financial uh, wherewithal within the first sixty to ninety days of the contract to be able to manage payroll, inventory, and all those kinds of things. So um, the the factor can actually provide you a a uh, credit acceptance letter, or credit approval letter that you can turn in with your contract with your bid to show your, your um, financial uh, wherewithal to, to manage the contract. So what I'm hearing is that you have um, your government contracts 
-hmm. all running through now. But I, I, I no longer use now, but I use now for where we just not too long ago stopped using now. But um, I use now for years. And here's why I continue to use now, um, even though we were. And here's the other thing with using now because of the way that now is structured. So let me just explain how now works. So what now, the way, I love the way now works because now always creates a clean cash flow um, uh, uh, report for the business owner. So because the way that now works is that once you um, submit an invoice, so now has an API that's tied to your QuickBooks Online. When you submit an invoice, I want y'all to hear me say this, not submit. When you create an invoice in your QuickBooks, right? So let's say I got a contract with CDC and um, we've just finished uh, 30 days on the contract. I'm submitting my invoice to CDC. I now create that invoice in my QuickBooks. Every 48 hour, every every day, now account sweeps that account. Once it it it, it sees that a, 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 a invoice has been initiated, within 48 hours, they pay that invoice. I'm going to say that again. You hadn't even sent the invoice to the to, to your, your government uh, rep yet. All you've done is create this invoice and then you're going to send it now. And now it's on the email where you send the invoice to the government asking for payment within 48 hours. Now is paying you that money. And then they worry about when they get paid. Yeah, that's how I got addicted. Cause somebody <laughs> did quick. It was like crap, <laughs> and I could never get out of the cycle. Like, so, yeah, <laughs> so it was yeah. hard to get out of it. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful because yeah, that money is red, and now was uh, charging three percent. And I want y'all to hear this. Now it's charging three percent, but I'm building in the three percent um, because now I know that that three percent. I could expense it out on my tax return because it's allowable if I'm using now because what? It's not interest payment. It is bank fees, uh, uh, account charge account fees, right? right? So for those of that are in the 8 day program that are uh -huh. out there, and I just learned that from Tansy, I didn't realize... Um, you have to also be careful when you tie into those factoring companies. Many people don't understand those contracts are really owned by SBA and you're subcontracting. Mm -hmm. So if you tie into a factoring company, you have to get that approved. Otherwise, they can kick you out of the program because now you you in S SBA's view, you're changing the control of that contract and control is finance. <laughs> so did you have to go through that process when you tied into now? Yeah, and, and here's the thing with now, because they work with so many federal contractors. If you're in the business environment, particularly in Atlanta, you've probably come into contact with now because they are one of the vendors that even the banks who decline you recommend mm -hmm. because it helps people's um, books to look cleaner because your receivables are, you're looking, your cash flow is looking good because now you're getting this money recycling through your account. And now you have, so now account, um, and let me say that Laura um, Hogden and um, Stacey Abrams actually owns Now Account. Yes, mm -hmm. the Stacey Abrams. And they. Uh, this is a business that she's had way before her, her political career really um, uh, became uh, so famous. But uh, Laura, I met Laura at um, the DeKalb Chamber. I was a member of the DeKalb Chamber of Commerce. And that's how I knew about Now Account. Um, and Ted Cummins introduced me to Laura. So um, they're very well um, established in the community. And so they know how to work with an SBA. Everybody's familiar with now. Mm -hmm. 
And so they uh, they just got a large funding from the government. And so now it is it, it is a is an entity that is tried and proven and people know about it. So it, it's not the typical run of the mill um, factoring company. Yeah, that because that it. can be a night nightmare. They right. the, they were doing the same thing with my clients, harassing. It, it, ooh. So I, I get it. Yeah, um, it, it's almost one fifteen. Um, I'll take one more question, and then we can close it out. And and Stacy, you can leave leave with some lasting words. Does anyone have one question you want to open your mic? Yes. And ask? Hi. Carrie King, thank you so much, Stacey. This has been wonderful. Um, so my question was, you mentioned um, that you recently um, kind of got off of the um, factoring hamster wheel. So how do you how do you do how do you make the transition to say, OK, I no longer need a factoring company um, and I can sustain or get, I, I guess, more traditional financing or use the, my existing credit to to fund and and break up essentially with the factoring company. Yeah, I think because we had um good reserves and um you know, we had and that's the main thing that do you have reserve to sustain you through the time that you're backing off of the factor. So, if you don't have the reserves to cushion the adjustment where and the other thing was that the vendors that I have now are quick pay. So in 2011, um, President Obama uh, created the Prop Pay Act, and I'm going to give y'all a little tip. If you're a small business and you're doing business with the federal government and you're invoicing the federal government, I want you to change how you submit your invoice. When you submit your invoice, and this is that same contracting officer that taught me that I could really just get rid of that factor and, and work with the government to do it. She also taught me that um, when I'm submitting an invoice, I want to highlight in bold and red on the very top of that in invoice in big, bold letters. I am a small business. The Prop Pay Act says that the government is supposed to pay you in 30 days. And if they don't, they can be fined 4%. And let me tell you, if you get into, I got into a situation with the government where there was, they had changed vendors and I wasn't getting my payment. And I started sending these, these emails. And I'm telling you, they were more nervous than anything that they would have to pay that 4% uh, penalty fee if it exceeded the amount of days that they didn't pay me. And now they're being held to it that if they don't pay small business in a time in a timely manner according to prompt pay that they're going to be penalized and this goes against the contracting team that's not doing their job or if it's a financing thing so so now I put on every single invoice that I submit to the federal government in big, bold print, this is a small business. And so now I can back off of the factor because what we we had reserves and we know that our payments are coming in within a 15 to 30 day cycle. And, but that's a complete and approved um, invoice. So you have to take some ownership on it too. You yeah. have to make sure that your invoices are accurate. The yeah. clock doesn't uh, start ticking until it's been approved. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And we're we're meticulous about that. And you would you wouldn't believe how many vendors don't submit their invoices on. I, I just never understand that. Don't don't submit their invoices on time or correctly to the government. So there's a lot of vendors that. If you're somebody who is not, um, you know, uh, over your finances, not if you're, you need to get somebody to manage your government contract, invoicing and billing system. You, if you're somebody that's not good with money and you don't submit your bills on time, you know, you do not want to do that with the government. So you need to hire somebody to manage that billing and invoicing process. Oh, and again, that was me. As I say, 
I started out using Excel until, because again, the government wants those invoices in a specific um, way, meaning they want your current uh, dollars, especially multi-years, current mm -hmm. dollars year to date, and then the total that you spend on the contract. And I had a wrong formula in it. And it wasn't good because the government thought they had $80,000 more than they should. <laughs> and that wasn't a good look. So I agree with you. But yeah. you have to understand what the system looks like. And that's what I say with you. You, Where I see you having the most success was understanding first yourself as the CEO, what's the process? Once you understood the process, you now put the systems in place. Once you put the systems in place, now you brought the people in place to manage the system. Um, and you've been able to transfer everything that you've done to managing a business. You're not in that business. And I think for us, that's where our challenge is. We, we don't think big. <laughs> Right. You think big because you're gonna yeah. have a, a plane, right? <laughs> the Guyana princess. <laughs> <laughs> the princess, that's it. So for me, um, Paula is right. I, I just um I remember early on in my business, um, I met this guy, Bob Shelton, um, in the REO space. He was the largest um asset management uh real estate brokerage firm in the state of South Carolina. Uh, this man, I mean, was doing thousands of properties a month um, in the asset management space. And um, I met him at a conference um, out in Vegas um, and went and spent three days with him in uh, in South Carolina. And he was an old guy. And he told me, he said, young lady, he said, the only thing I need to teach you is that you need to create a business that has nothing to do with you being there on a day-to-day -day basis. He said, I just came back from being gone on vacation for three weeks and I came back and I'm in the way. He said, you need to know what's going on, but you don't need to be a part of the daily process. So when you know you're successful is when you can write yourself out of the daily functions of the business. And so that has been my goal in life. And, you know, people that know me know that I do a lot, but it's always been my, my you know, my zest to get to that place where we're creating the systems, where we're teaching the people and where it doesn't matter who enters or exits the system, the system holds. And my team, I, I know uh, my son, Kamar Robinson is on the call. Um, my uh, procurement manager, Dentista Dean, and my administrator, uh, Merlin Osborne, they're on the call and they know me. I like documentation. I like writing things down. I like creating an SOP for a process and a system. And I like people to take ownership over what they're supposed to, um, to be doing as a part of that system. And then I like cross-training because like I said, uh, we just had somebody exit the system recently. Does that shake the system? Does that change the system? We didn't miss a beat, right? Because you're creating a system that holds. So no matter who exits or enters, right, you've created a process where it doesn't disrupt the system in such a significant way that it's unable to, to, to hold its functionality. And so um, I have a new contract. I'm right now in uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, because I have a contract with um, with Amazon. I have about 50 um, uh, vans and trucks with Amazon. I'm now an Amazon delivery service partner. We have about 100 um, employees out here in Charlotte. Got this contract two years ago. Came down here, stood up the contract. We got a management staff of seven people. And I come here, I have a place here now. And I'm kind of, and we went and started two businesses overseas in Guyana, South America. And so I'm building that business. So my job now is to create um, a, a process and a system for each of those businesses so they can operate independently. And I, Paula taught me this word, and I'm essentially the corporate monitor where I'm dealing with high level issues, where I'm just the, the main QC person over the system 
victims and I'm making sure that the appropriate people and exit and enter the system to keep it working uh, efficiently. And so that's the role I'm kind of playing right now. I love it. Don't y'all want to be grow up and be like Miss Stacy, CEO, and, and changing the the mindset. So I think that's a wonderful way to end and nuggets to leave them with. You give them one line. And what's your words for this year as we end? Um, the the main thing I want people to do is create formal process. Create, write things down. Create processes within your business. This is be strategic. That's it right there. Be strategic about your business. I think that there isn't enough critical thinking and strategic planning that's happening within black and brown businesses. And we suffer because we don't put systems in place because we haven't created any strategic plan and we're not asking our people where the gaps are and how to fill them. I get on my folks' nerves because I ask every day, what's the problem? What we need to do? How we need to fix it? What can we do? And don't be afraid for people to give you negative. Even if you feel like, oh man, my business is unstable right now. I got some things I need to fix. Be open to hearing from your people or from outsiders what they see those gaps are and be willing to create a strategic plan and draft a process that can help you to close those gaps. Excellent. I love the closing. <laughs> um, we've gone over, but it was worth going over. So thank you, Stacy, for giving us your time. Also, tomorrow is the information session. And we have 10 seats remaining for the January cohort, which will be starting on Tuesday. And thank you, community. You all have a, a great day. <laughs> thank you so much. Please, I put my, um, my email in the chat. If you have any questions, um, uh, follow-up questions, if you just need a word, if you just um, need any information that I can share, um, everybody knows that I'm always willing to share, and I believe everybody deserves at least a conversation. Uh, and if you're talking to her and she instructs you to do <laughs> something, <laughs> you better do it because don't come back to her without doing it. So yes. again, thank you for always trying to impact the community and share your knowledge. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye.